that's all we have time for from Syria. Uh, but that makes an excellent segue into our next panel debate, um, having four war zone journalists. Uh, makes an ec excellent segue into the next panel, which is about how to protect journalists, and particularly freelance journalists, from death or sudden disappearance. Conversations like this often have a ritualistic quality, like howls into the wind. Isn't it terrible what's happening to journalists? They're getting killed. But in the last couple of weeks and last month, um, there's been a new kind of urgency in all of this. The killing of the Bulgarian journalist, Victoria, Victoria Marinova, and the almost gothic cruelty meted out to Jamal Khashoggi in the confines of the Saudi consulate mean that it's almost as if the game has changed. Perhaps something to do with the sayings and doings of the American and the Russian presidents mean that it's almost as if bets are off everywhere and journalists can be bumped off with utter impunity. It's almost become a kind of competition, it seems, at times. Anyway, to talk about this and what we might do to help, um, I'll introduce you to your chair, who can introduce you to the rest of the panel. Uh, Sarah Jaziri is the uh, uh, head of the Frontline Freela the Freelance, Freelance Register. Frontline Register, the FFR, I think. Um, <laughs> and um, we're very glad to have her. Sarah. Um, thank you so much for being here and staying for the final panel of the, the last two days of the symposium. Um, I think it's very apt that we're talking about threats against journalists. Um, as Jake mentioned, um, it's been very much in the news if you're following um, the horrible, horrible saga um, of the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, he was a Saudi journalist and columnist for the Washington Post. Um, so that really kind of reminds you, um, and really puts it into perspective, the threats that journalists face. But I kind of want to open it more today, not just talking about killings. Um, actually, the deaths of journalists has been going down, but the threats against journalists has been uh, soaring according to the International Federation of Journalists. Um, and so what we do we mean by threats? It's not just killings, it's uh, intimidation, harassment, um, journalists having to flee because they can't... Um, can't stay home anymore and report, and especially thinking about local journalists in that case. Um, we have an excellent panel today to discuss this, an international panel. Um, on my left, we have Mei Jong, who's a freelance investigative journalist um, who was based in Kabul for many years. In fact, her report uh, on the bombing of an MSF hospital in is it which Kunduz. In Kunduz, um, uh, was a long piece for The Intercept, um, attracted awards at the Daniel Pearl Award and the Bayo Prix Award, and Kado Award uh, last year. Uh, and then on my right, we have Laurent Richard. Uh, he's an investigative journalist. I probably said your name wrong again, so sorry. No. Uh, but he's also the founder of Forbidden Stories. Uh, Forbidden Stories is a platform um, whose mission is to continue to publishing the work of journalists who are facing threats, prison, or murder. Um, and he'll tell you more about his organization and his experience as an investigative journalist. Um, and then uh, to Laurent's right, we have, sorry, uh, Pavla Holokova, uh, she's a, a, an investigative journalist from the Czech Republic and she's the founder of the Czech Center for, for Investigations, which is part of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Um, uh, Pavla, uh, so the OCCRP is one of the, the largest investigative journalism platforms and works worldwide. And then furthest to the right, um, to my right, is Michael uh, Scott Moore who's an American freelance journalist and novelist. Um, his latest book, which just came out probably this week or today, in, in the UK. UK. In the UK, just in the UK. Um, his book, uh, The Desert and the Sea, um, tells uh, of his experience uh, being kidnapped in Somalia by Somalian p uh, pirates, where he was held for 977 days in 2012. Um, and also, you can come and see him at the Frontline Club on Monday <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully get, get a copy of the book signed. Um, so, yes, basically, I want to sort of open up the discussion uh, with the panel and, and the journalists on this panel, especially looking at what threats journalists face and what we can do be to better protect them. Um, I'll start with May, mm -hmm. um, who's uh, sort of talking about your work, especially I guess, in, in Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is one of the, for this year, according to RSF's barometer, is the top country for killed journalists. Um, so, can you talk a little bit more about journalists in Afghanistan and your experience working there? 
I just want to make sure, is the mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, the press corps in Afghanistan, it's been ever dwindling um, since the height of the war in 2007. That's when the, um, that, that was the year of the Obama surge. Um, it's an apocryphal story, but allegedly there were, you know, upwards of three, four, five, uh, I think six, seven, maybe hundred reporters who had been registered, not in country full time, but covering Afghanistan from various different bureaus around the world. and. I think now, I mean, by, I, I left a year ago, and I think then you could maybe you could really just count reporters, either bureaus or freelancers. Maybe there was a dozen people reporting on it full time, foreigners, um, and then um, the the the, uh, the Afghan reporters who are obviously you know living there and um, their families there and their the journalism is their work. Um, many of them. You know, there, we've been sort of hemorrhaging reporters for a long time. It, in Afghanistan, it's less that you are targeted as a reporter. It's more that it's very violent. And so if you happen to be a resident of a, a violent city, then, of course, the, the odds of you um, being killed at some point is it also goes up. And so it, it, it wasn't a, a, a necessarily a, tar a targeted attack on reporters. It's more of a commentary on how um, dangerous Afghanistan is. Thank you. Laurent. Hi. Hi. Um, we had a session earlier, and you were talking about why you started Forbidden Stories. Could you recount that for our audience here? Sure. Um, so as you say, Forbidden Stories is a non-profit investigative platform devoted to, to continue uh, the stories and the work of um, assassinated and jailed reporters. We start it um, just one year ago, actually. And it's, um, it's about... Um, basically making sure people get access to critical information. Most of the time, journalists who get killed are working on very important topics, such as um, environment, uh, human rights violation, um, organized crime, corruption, money laundering. And so we do think that, um, yeah, that's the, the, the killing of one journalist is not a, just a question of, of one new number, of one new ranking. It's, uh, yeah. it's a, so all the information we are missing and all the information the, the public opinion is, uh, is missing. So um, I start from thinking about that. Uh, I'm an investigative reporter for the past 18 years. I was doing some long-form documentaries most of the time for the French public television. And sometimes on the conflict zone, sometimes in, in the country where there is no freedom of the press. And, and so I was sometimes also in that position as other reporters here of being able to investigate that corruption story that other local journalists can no longer investigate because it was too dangerous for them. And um, um, I start thinking about uh, creating forbidden stories when something more personal arrived, as I told you before. Um, it was in 2015, I was working in a press agency called Première Ligne, and our neighbors were sharing the same flow in the very same building in the middle of Paris where the newsroom of Charlie Hebdo. And uh, we, were, um, we were colleagues, they were working in their newsroom and they were, the, the newsroom of Charlie was just one meter right next on the corridor. Mm. And, uh, and so on 2015, uh, two terrorists of Al-Qaeda entered the building and, 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 and killed a lot of them, a lot of uh, friends and colleagues. And with um, some colleagues of uh, Première Ligne, we were there for, for uh, I entered the newsroom, I did everything I can to, uh, to find uh, who I can help and who was alive. And, yeah. and so I, I tell that because it's really something that gave me kind of a lot of motivation to, to first it was a kind of, uh, uh, difficult situation, kind of uh, trauma, but then I, st I really start thinking about what I can do as a journalist to uh, continue the work of uh, murdered reporters and, um, and how to keep the stories alive and how to make sure that uh, the story or the information will reach the public and how to defeat that kind of vi very violent censorship. So, um, and 
many of the examples were already existing. The Khadija project, mm. wh which was an OCCIP project, was just amazing. It was the, a group of investigative journalists who decided to, to continue the stories, the work of Khadija Ismailova, who was jailed in Baku. In 1976, you have this uh, example of the Arizona project. Uh, 30 journalists from the US were completing the work of Don Bowles, who was assassinated in a bomb explosion yeah. in Phoenix, Arizona. So there were that, that kind of two, three examples in the past. Even in Brazil, there were another collaboration like that. And um, with all the friends, we start thinking about creating that nonprofit like that. So probably we c I can sh show you a, a video uh, summarizing what we, we have done so far. That was great, yep. Okay. Have the button? I don't have on me, but I, on, someone told me just to do this kind of sign. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Daphne Karana Galizia killed when a bomb exploded. Connected to the aggressive work she had done calling out <laughs> corruption in Malta. Forbidden Stories was created as a platform to protect stories of silenced journalists. Threatened journalists can back up their sensitive information through one of our encrypted channels. Their stories will be held securely. In case something happens, Forbidden Stories will be able to access the stories, complete them thanks to its partners, and reveal it broadly. The first Forbidden Story was about Daphne. We coordinated the work of 45 journalists to review a massive number of files in a complete secrecy and complete Daphne's investigations with one common objective, revealing what her killers wanted to hide. Six months after her death, we hit the news. An international consortium of journalists is scrutinizing Malta as part of the so-called Daphne Project. In one day, and for weeks, Daphne's stories made the headlines all over the world. Forbidden Stories, an international network of journalists designed to finish these stories and the investigations that was working on. In a week, hundreds of millions of people have been potentially exposed to Daphne's stories, dramatically increasing the number of readers of her blog. This is how a local investigation became an international affair. The European Commission will pursue this. We will keep pushing the Maltese authorities. We will keep pushing them. No stone should remain unturned. Today, we gave Daphne a new voice. And as long as journalists will be threatened, jailed, or killed, we will keep stories alive. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, actually, when we're talking about threats against journalists, um, it, it seems so recently a lot of this, we, we, when we think of threats, we think of conflict journalists or journalists working in countries where press freedom is an issue or human rights violations are a, a massive issue. Um, with Daphne, obviously, she was from Europe, working in Malta. Um, I was looking at the RSF barometer uh, on killed journalists for 2018. Afghanistan's number one, and that's understandable. Uh, but number two is the tie between Mexico and the US. And I know that's really related to, to one um, mass shooting in, in, a, in a local newspaper. But I think that just, again, just sort of really hit me that, you know, journalists are under a threat, whether they're working in investigations or in conflict or in countries where, you know, there's, there's the rule of law and human rights violations, etc. Yeah, and I think that. That was really, sh of course, it was shocking because it was in Europe. We were yeah. not that used to to th see that, and which which is actually much more shocking. That's the in the current impunity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, still now, one year after the killing of Daphne, you don't have any name on the mastermind, and you have some people arrested, suspected to have triggering the bomb, pushing on the button of the cell phone re linked uh, to the explosive device. But we don't know who ordered the, the killing of Ta Daphne, and we just know that most of the investigation done by Daphne Karana Kaliza were targeting the very same group of people, which was, they were inside the government, she was investigating fuel smuggling, she was investigating organized crime, corruption, mm. and, um, and we, by, with this investigation, with 45 amazing reporters from 18 news organizations, we, we, we saw how 
the Maltese authorities, I really know, investigate seriously the case. And so that's, um, this is um, even more shocking, and, and that tells you also about the power or the influence of European institution on a state member. Yeah. We're talking about state member who is sure. supposed to, to comply to some values and to investigate. And what is happening now and what is happening in, in other countries in Europe, that's we probably the Europe is very too lax on corruption issues and does not, uh, doesn't do the work they're supposed to do in investigative corruption shame. So that's why journalists are right now the first who are paying the price, the price because there are some uh, corruption scandals that, mm. um, and there's a lot of crimes that need to, to expose and, and so that's um, the problem we are facing now. Okay. Just to continue that conversation, Pavla, um, you were mentioning before um, one of your colleagues who was, who was murdered in his apartment with his fiance. Um, and they think, again, that's in Slovakia, it's, in, you know, it's, it's not in a war zone somewhere. Um, can you talk about the threats that investigative journalists are, are facing, reporting uh, as, as um, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, talking about threats against investigative journalism, reporting on corruption, etc. Yeah, like <clears throat> usually you can get your mind ready for the fact that you are going to the war zone and that you are going to be under really a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. But once the journalists are being killed at their homes, you can't really get ready for it. Oh. So. Uh, I always believe, like, I'm from Czech Republic, my colleague Jano, he was from Slovakia, I always believe, like, okay, we are actually quite the same countries, we are not. Uh, and the murder of my colleague Jano is, is actually the, the proof that yeah. we are not. What is good is that the, the police investiga investigation, unlike in Malta, is really going somewhere. Uh, only within last couple of weeks, uh, the Slovak police detained those people who, who assassinated Jano and his fiance. And actually there are strong leads also to the person who ordered the assassination. So that's kind of a ray of hope. You, you were also mentioning before, um, one of the ways if, by publishing the stories um, of, because a lot of the people that you work with, with OCC RP, um, they're working under like, stories where they're attracting threats, etc. But, 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 but by publishing them, it's almost a way of protecting them, or at least or, or publishing them in other kind of platforms as well, so that the story isn't just relying on one person. Can yeah, you talk a little bit more about that? It's actually probably one of the very few solutions that we can do how to protect us yeah. is to show that it's not single journalist who is working on a story and it's not single platform that's going to publish the story. Uh, if we share the information, uh, what we must do uh, at the OCCRP, not only with editors, but also with other colleagues, uh, once I will, as, as the one who is the reporter, feel under any kind of a pressure, I can actually hand over all the data to my editor or to someone else to finish the story. What actually needs to send out the message, like you can't kill the story by killing of the journalist, and if you will do it, uh, then you need to face a whole group of journalists who are going to work even harder on put a light on the stories that was not supposed to be published. Sure. And have you, um, could you tell us about the um, journalist Khadija? Um, and because that was an example that I thought was really Yeah, it's, a, it's a quite a nice example that yeah. Laura already mentioned. We at OCCRP, we did something that we called Project Khadija. Uh, it happened actually that our colleague in Azerbaijan, what is actually dictatorship, but they can't call it dictatorship. Uh, she was put in jail and sentenced for seven and a half years uh, for doing first quality investigative journalism. Uh, at that point when she was sentenced to seven and a half years in jail, uh, we decided that we are going to set up a project Khadija. Uh, and that we are going not only to finish uh, all the stories she started, but we are going to come up with the new stories and sign it with her name. This, because 
like every second month there was a story on Azerbaijan published by OCCRP. It created enormous pressure on the Azerbaijani government. Uh, for us, we, we only le learn it quite later when, when Khadija was actually released from jail after serving uh, one year and a couple of months. She said, okay, you know, this project, it was great, but actually you also put a lot of pressure on me because they really believed that I'm writing the stories here in jail and I am sending it somehow out of the jail to be published. So they did a lot, all kind of searches uh, in her cell, the, the strip search and so on, but actually it, it really created enormous pressure and it helped to get Khadija out of jail. That's great. Um, Michael, you went to Somalia to yeah. do a story about the pirates or specifically, and before you we went on that trip, what kind of preparation or thinking did, were you doing in terms of preparing yourself for doing a story where obviously that it had a lot of risks attached to it? Well, we knew it was dangerous. And yeah. I, I traveled with another journalist named Ashwin Rahman, who was a very good um, documentary maker for German television. And he'd been in and out of war zones into Somalia before, too. So working with him, we found a, a guide who we thought would be reliable, uh, a Somali elder in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we sat with him for a, a few months. So we, we were pretty careful. And we also took a route through central Somalia that other journalists had done before. And this guide, uh, this fixer, had brought a German journalist there before, too. So um, there was a lot to fix, but yeah. uh, there were also a lot of things that were also hard to predict. So. Um, when did you, can you tell us a little bit more about what happened to you? Yeah, in January 2012, I traveled to Somalia um, with Ashwin, and we, did, we had about 10 days of pretty good reporting in mm -hmm. central Somalia um, about pirates. Uh, before Ashwin flew off um, to Mogadishu, and then from the airport, um, I drove with my fixer and my guard, and there was a sort of road through the dust um, where a technical a sort of battle wagon was waiting for us. And those guys were looking to capture both of us, I think. Uh, they got me. Wow. So I, was, I was held uh, after that for two and a half years. And in terms of, did anyone know straight away that you had been kidnapped or that you had gone missing? I, I kind of want to raise this issue because um, we're talking about sort of freelance journalists and they don't have the support of a big media, or organ media organization behind them. So things like when, when a freelance journalist does a difficult to report from a story like going to Somalia, um, they don't have an editor. Sometimes they don't have an editor at the end of the phone because I'm doing your regular check-ins and having yeah. so the backup of a bigger media organization and insurance to sort of step in when things do go wrong. So you went in as a freelance journalist, I understand. Did yeah, no, I, I went as a freelancer for sure. I had been working for Spiegel online, but I wasn't there on assignment from them. I, I had a couple of American magazines magazines behind me, mm -hmm. and I had a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting in Washington. Uh, they gave some support, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have insurance. That was yeah. up to me, and I, 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 I was trying to get it, and it, it looked good, and then at the last minute it fell through, and I, I should have canceled the trip. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of when you were kidnapped, what, what happened? Did who raise the alarm? Who helped, tried to oh, help you? Oh, I think Ashwin found out about it as soon as he landed, and he would have called both the German and American governments. I'm also yeah. a German citizen. And the FBI had um, agents at my mother's door within 12 hours. So wow. the response was pretty fast. Great. May, if you could talk more about that as a freelance journalist, you feel supported when you go in places working like in Afghanistan or do you have, when you have commissions or assignments, do you have the support of the media organization behind you? The problem is that, um, as you know, you know, um, media is bankrupt and yeah. nobody's hiring, which means that there's a whole generation of reporters like myself who came of age where we couldn't get jobs at bureaus. And if you wanted to correspond from abroad, you had to strike out on your own, which is what me and many others did, many who are members of FFR. And uh, you, you have to do the pre-reporting before you sell the story because until you've re done the reporting, you don't even know if you have a story or not, um, which means that, yeah, you are fronting a lot of not only the costs, you know, in terms of resources and time, but also the risk. You end up subsuming a lot of the risk that traditionally in the past institutions would have absorbed. Um, and we, we talked about this earlier, but... So essentially, effectively, what that means is for me to 
uh, be a responsible reporter, I need to uh, call in a lot of favors, and I rely heavily on personal relationships I have with um, either you know members of bigger institution, whether it be other bureaus or NGOs who do have in-house staff who's, you know, maybe, I don't know, ex-Marines or what have you and their security officers. And so before going on any trip in Afghanistan, where which is where I reported from until last year for five years, I would always either call, uh, yeah, I would call a, a, a security officer who works for these NGOs or bureaus, um, or I would ask around, you know, a lot of my that there's a there's isn't really a, a, a clear distinction between personal life and uh, professional life in mm. ex many expat communities around the world, and so a lot of your friends end up being people who are either in government. They may not be sources you d quote directly, but they're definitely people you will call to, you know, get a feel for uh, a place or a story and issue. And so it just it it's it's you're you're running a bureau, but you know you're doing everything, um, and. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a really, it's it's not a good replicable model. I often joke whenever people come up to me and ask, you know, how can I do what you do? I ask them, do you have any other skill? <laughs> if <laughs> so, you should. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Brilliant. So um, I think we could talk a little bit about the organization that I run. It's called the Frontline Freelance Register, um, and it was set up in 2013 by a group of freelance journalists and the Frontline Club Charitable Trust. Um, May is one of them, our members. Um, and it's really that was, was set up to advocate for the better treatment of freelance journalists with media organizations in terms of safety and welfare. Um, and we work with a lot of partner organizations, um, including the Rory Peck Trust. And I think the head of programs is here somewhere. So hopefully she'll, ask, she'll talk more about um, how to work safer as a freelance journalist. Um, but yeah, for sure, um, m more reporting has been done by freelancers. Um, May talked about the, 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 the economics of media organizations are not doing so well these days. Um, so a lot of funding of, for journalism is done by grant makers, like the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and so the one of the things that FFR we're definitely looking into is whether the respons responsibility lies when you don't have these amazing commissions uh, where a new organization will send you out somewhere with insurance, with security, um, uh, you know, with an editor on, uh, on the phone, et cetera. Um, and we do definitely advocate for the responsibility of freelance journalists themselves to get themselves safety trained, to work on risk assessments, to um, try and mitigate some of the obvious risks before they go into any, any place and to be responsible as well because once you know if something does happen to a freelance journalist who's there to help um they said there's amazing organizations like the rory peck and uh, committee for journalists and force without borders but it's also um you know if, if you go into these agents places it's give as much information do as much research as possible and um, so that really leads me on to what else can we do to protect journalists especially freelancers and local journalists as well because you know, that they stay in the places where they've been threatened. Um, maybe Pavla, you can, you work a lot with local journalists, investigative journalists. What kind of th other kind of advice or tips on yeah, staying well, safe? Yeah, well, always tell someone where you are going. Yeah. And before uh, doing the interview, tell someone, okay, I'm going there and there, interview this and this person. And if I won't get back to you in two hours, do this and that. Uh, I believe, like, most of the, the people <coughs> uh, would happily call the embassy, for example, even if they are not journalists or even if they are not professional organizations who actually are here to help you, to, to, to take care of you. And, of course, <coughs> think. <laughs> yeah. And you were talking about training. Was it yes, we, training we well? at OCCRP, we have um, uh, various trainings on security. It's not only uh, online security, it's also personal security. Uh, what is super useful, because we as uh, investigative journalists, sometimes we totally underestimate our value. Uh, it's not only because we just don't feel that important that somebody would waste money on uh, killing us. Uh, but sometimes it's also because uh, the people we are writing about quite often believe that we know much more than we actually know. 
uh, and that is a uh, good reason for them to, to kill us as an investigative journalist. So uh, we did a personal security training when we actually uh, have been trained for one week only how to recognize someone is following us because uh, most of the reporters who were murdered in the last, let's say, 15 years, they reported to someone that they feel that they are being followed, but they are not sure. And indeed, they've been followed. Yeah. So basically trust your gut instincts as a journalist? Yes. When you feel yes, we, we are actually, the, this is the problem, because we are quite often trained not to trust our gut mm -hmm. instinct. Yeah. Because we can't make assumptions, we need to deliver the proofs. And somehow it got twisted into our real life, and that's the problem. Laurent, you work with a lot of journalists then that are under threat. Um, yeah. What kind of discussions do you have with them? <coughs> the thing is that we, 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 the goal is to have a conversation, because basically what is killing the journalists is that when they are work, working alone, mm. when we saw, I know, the case of... Uh, a reporter called Cecilio Pineda in Mexico. He has been killed in 2017. And he was just publishing very critical information on the uh, corruption and some link with some narcos and, and the governors. And he published information on Facebook, doing a Facebook Live, and he was killed two hours after. Wow. Uh, in India, you have some journalists who investigate illegal mining. They got killed one week after that. But mm. there is a, the, the, the common thing is that uh, most of them are working alone. Yeah. They are publishing on their Facebook pages because they don't have the backup of uh, any newsroom behind them, and they are really in danger. So um, as the, the, the key thing, I think there are very few things to protect journalists, to be honest, but one of the key things is um, collaboration. Collaboration yeah. brings protection. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. Collaboration means, as Pavla say, talking with someone about the threats, talking with someone about the next interview you're going to do, and talking about the, the story, the investigation, the data, the leaks you receive. But when you are alone, when you are in the middle of Mexico and you're publishing on your Facebook the stories of corruption with who you are talking about. Sure. So what we try to initiate with, with, uh, with Forbidden Stories, because we were doing the Daphne project, that's one part of the activity. The mm -hmm. other part is about starting a conversation and starting a network with at-risk journalists all over the world and say, if you don't have a newsroom to talk, we can talk together. And please, if you have some information you want to protect, uh, we will never publish, of course, your information. But if something happens to you, we have the information. We would be able to fact-check independently and to continue uh, your work. And you can let the people know that you already protect information. So it's, um, I think this is, um, this is really, again, about collaboration and recreating a network. We see what is a global trend right now yeah. in, in Europe, in the US, in South America. Uh, and we, s we saw the Trump administration, we saw the tr President Trump himself just mm. uh, yesterday um, um, talking, inciting, inviting to kind of violence against the journalists. Yeah, so when you have the President of yeah. the <laughs> US uh, sending this signal all over the world, people in Baku will say, hey, don't give Correct. us any kind of lesson. Look at what's happening in America. Yeah. And that's the problem. And so that's... Um, that's really concerning. So more than ever, we need to work together and to, mm. to, to protect the information and to, and to, to, be, to publish at once some uh, stories. And something that you're working on, on forbidden, forbidden stories as well, is to create that network of investigative journalists. And that's for that kind of objective is to, more, you know, there's no kind of an institution that will protect you, but to, kind of to share that collaboration and, that, and share like, this advice and tips on how to yeah. keep safe. Yeah, having a conversation that where are you yeah. going, uh, what kind of threats you receive, uh, what we can do. Do you want us to publish a story or not? Probably the, the publication of the story will be a silly sure. idea, will, will endanger, or do we have to wait six months until your family escape? Yeah. So, so that's, um, okay. um, yeah, I, I think the, that's very important to reconnect sure. and, to, uh, and to think about all local reporters who are alone, don't have the chance to have a kind of newsroom, and to, when we have freedom of the press here in mm. our country, we need to export a little bit that sure. in other countries, I think. Michael, um, when Laurent was talking about having that collaboration with other people when you're working on a story, 
how do you work as a freelance journalist? Are you, do you work quite independently or do you have the ability to work with colleagues or collaborate with colleagues, etc.? Sure, you mean before you go into the field? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, th there are always other people who have had similar experiences and you, you get to know them beforehand, you know. So even it's very important competing. to have those networks, etc. Sure, yeah, and I did that. And I, I traded information with, with other people who'd covered the story before. Um, I, I think that's really important because there are only a few people, depending on the story, if you're working out on the edges like that, uh, there, there's, some, there's sometimes only a few people on the planet who, who know about the story. Sure. And so even if you're competing, you should also co collaborate a little bit. And did, have you experienced that, that there is a kind of spirit of collaborations, especially on working in difficult stories. Um, yeah. So other journalists do try and help when they can. Of course, there's always going to be competition, sure. etc. but yeah. it's important to use your, your networks and mm -hmm. let absolutely. people know where you're going and to, to do your research, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I had done that. I mean, we had yeah. traded uh, with other journalists. I had traded sort of the names of people who could work as guides in that area and that sort of thing. So Great. We, that's so, um, We've been talking about threats, but it's mainly been about sort of physical threats. Um, I want to talk about kind of online harassment. Um, I'm looking at you, Mary, because it's women journalists are one, you know, it's an issue that affects women journalists, I think, more than any other, uh, the, the male journalists. Um, this is something that you've experienced in your online harassments on Twitter and social media and yep, of those stories published that's maybe sensitive, etc. Sure. I mean, the online harassment stuff doesn't bother me too much because they don't know where I live, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it is what it is. Um, but the thing that strikes me is I was talking to an editor of mine just the other day and I, I realized that um, there hasn't been a single story that I've worked on where I wasn't sexually harassed or assaulted. Wow. Which is nuts. But I, again, I think it's less about you know, being targeted as a reporter. I think it's more about the fact that if you're a woman, um, that's just gonna, it's gonna happen to you. Um, and, and also, I, the, the profession of being a reporter, I, I, when I was growing up and, you know, wanting to, aspiring to be a reporter, no one told me that this was like a dangerous profession. Mm. You know, people, we talk, think about, you know, firefighters or police officers or, you know, people who are literally in the front lines, like those being jobs where you're putting yourself in harm's, harm's, harm's way. But I think being a reporter for some reason, or maybe other people are smarter than I am, but I, it just never really clicked. And I think really only in the last year, maybe in my own life, or a couple of years, I've realized that um, people do pay a very, very high price. Mm. And if you don't pay that price yourself, there's a, there are externalities to your decision to make, you know, take risk, as in your, you'll make your loved ones suffer sure. or your parents suffer or what have you. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. And I mean, most people here know that uh, there was a Swedish reporter who was reporting in Denmark, of all places, and she was brutally killed. Um, that came as a shock in our community, I think, because of the sense of expectation be uh, among, you know, our circle of friends. I think, if anything, it's, you know, myself or others that people would worry for. Um, and so to, to have it happen to someone reporting on a reasonably in innocuous story, sure. one would argue, in Denmark, uh, it comes as a shock, but it also tells you that um, the job is dangerous in many ways, and mm. also that um, that's what reporting is. Like so much of reporting is, um, you know, getting into cars with strangers, knocking on random people's doors, walking in when they invite you in, um, things that are, you know, in any other scenario not socially sanctioned, and. Um, when I talk to older reporters, I, there, it, there does seem to be a distinction between, you know, people who are in their 50s or 60s or maybe a little bit younger or older, they talk about how, you know, pr writing press on their flak jacket helped them. Um, I have never done that and yeah. I would never do that. Do you go with a flak jacket in Afghanistan or like if you're doing, is, is it, does it bring attention I to I just you? wouldn't advertise the fact that yeah. they ask me, of course, if I'm in, like interviewing you, yeah. the first thing I'll say is that I'm a reporter, sure. but I've never felt that, oh, I'm, I'm a journalist, has helped and me And you'd be protected anyway. anymore. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, um, that era might be over. Sorry? <laughs> that era might be over. I think wearing it might be press over, but I mean, the irony is I feel like in America, at least now, because reporters are vilified, there's that like, 
there's like a sweet spot where like that veers into the realm of like coolness. And so like now I get like congratulated if I say I'm a reporter. Wow. Which <laughs> like you're really so weird. I mean, yeah. Especially Lauren was mentioning the US president is congratulating a politician for body slamming a Guardian reporter for asking mm -hmm. him a question about healthcare. Yeah. I mean, exactly. it's the, the, and calling, what's he calling? The enemy of the people? Yeah. The media enemy, enemy of the people. people. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that you were mentioning, um, I mean, did, you, did you go to journalism school or uh, so one thing I was thinking about is like how, how do we prepare for journalists kind of going, in, going into the profession? Um, you were just saying, you know, being invited into someone's house or getting into a car. That's the other things that's not really covered in like safety training. So I think safety <laughs> training is very much focused on checkpoints and ballistics, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be I said, an interesting point, actually, just your day-to-day -day activities as a journalist and working in places where there might be sort of threats or Denmark. Sure. Um, but people are always ask that question, how do you know who to trust and yeah. how do you know what the story is? And like it is just vibes and yeah. that sounds super new agey but i do think that the like gut instinct like there are all these like synonyms for what we call what i call vibes but i think yeah. it's you, you get you arrive at a point where you trust yourself because you talk to a hundred people or because you've like you know been working for how many ever years or because mm. you you like read all the books that are available in the world like in in some ways it's hard to quantify but i think also um, it's actually not that hard to be smart about things. Um, and, and, and I think this is why I'm also a little bit skeptical of the concept of journalism school. I just, I don't know if that can be taught. You just need to go and do it a hundred times. And the hundred and first time, like it will be easier. Great, that's good <laughs> advice. Um, I want to talk more about definitely trusting your instincts as a journalist um, and doing kind of taking some steps um, to letting people know where you are, having things like communication plans if you disappear, that there's um, something, uh, a process comes into action um, when someone can't reach you. Um, Michael, obviously you were kidnapped. Um, did you have communication plans in place, etc., when you were going to Somalia? And did that, and if the FBI showed at your parents during 12 hours, it sounds like there was something there that was effective. Yeah, I did have some plans. I mean, everyone knew where I was going yeah. and uh, everyone knew where I was, but um, I think what I didn't do was prepare to die. Wow. And that's also essential. You have to put a certain number of your affairs in order because you might die. Um, the, the things I didn't leave behind for my family were, were things like that. Um, and that's that's very important. You you also have to be re ready for the f for the fact that if you something like that does happen, your laptop will be used as evidence. So in other words, the first thing the F FBI did was find my laptop, which I had left behind yeah. in Nairobi, and put it on a shelf in New York. Wow. Uh, so How do you mean sure you used as evidence? Evidence against you? Or evidence oh, no, in favor of me. Okay, but great. Still, uh, you know, <laughs> but still, some of you going through all your personal effects, etc. The FBI probably scanned the whole, the whole hard drive. So wow. um, these are things you have to think about before you go. Absolutely, and in some, I'm going to talk about safety training. Um, so, um, some safety training providers do kind of scenarios on kidnappings. Had you done safety training before or after Somalia? I just wanted to ask you whether the kidnapping scenarios actually helped you in surviving 977 days. Oh, I'm sure it has. I mean, at the very least, I have an iron stomach now after everything. Wow. Through, but um, no, I, I, I think it's made me stronger in certain ways, but I don't recommend it for anyone. <laughs> Could we talk a little bit then about online threats and online risks, um, digital risks, uh, like how you protect yourself digitally? Um, I think the OCC, RP, also, I always get the P and the R mixed up, sorry. <laughs> um, you, got, you guys are very much on top of that as well. You have technicians and uh, people to help in the risk of journalists. Can you talk about a little bit how maybe you can keep safe online? <coughs> That's a question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, at OCCRP, we have a great tech team, and because we are people living in different countries, in different cities, uh, on the same projects, we need to resolve most of the problems uh, online. So uh, once we decide on a story that we are going to do as a project, then we uh, just assemble the team who's going to work on the project and then the tech team comes and is checking the computer of each of us just to check if they are secure enough to do to work on the story. 
uh, we have online platform and we actually upload all the documents and all the data and all the leads of the stories so the others can see it as well. And of course, we use uh, encrypted channels, we use encrypted emails and so on. What actually brings me to the question if uh, this may be the thing that actually puts us in a danger yeah. because uh, if the government in a, in a corrupted state or if the really rich people who just want to find out what we are working on, uh, if they only see encrypted emails, they usually get scared that we know much more that we actually we do know. So oh, we need idea. to even consider the fact that if they would know that we actually no, so little, <laughs> and we are such <laughs> idiots that we can't put them in a danger that they would let us live. Wow. Um, I'm going to open up some qu We only have 10 minutes, so I want to open up uh, questions for the audience. Um, if you can put your hands up high, it's really hard to see with all the lighting here. Oh, sorry, 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes for questions. Um, we have someone here uh, on the third row. Um, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Irving Wirt. I'm a Mexican reporter. Um, so I just wanted to challenge a little bit just this idea about exporting um, the freedom uh, from countries like, well, with liberal democracies, right, uh, to countries like Mexico or where just the practice of journalism is being, uh, well, under threat, right? So um, to me, I mean, I really appreciate and pretty much all this idea of uh, freedom of the press and watchdog journalism is something I believe and something I hold dear to my heart. But at the same time, um, I think this should be supported alongside with other political just efforts or endeavors. Because if we just, uh, just think that journalists can just do the, this, mm. this job on their own, sure. and we're not just fixing other institutions. I mean, I'm talking about the judiciary, I'm talking about the other institutions, the uh, rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, but also about the media itself and just mm. the lower salaries that these people are having there. I think it's kind of a, well, pretty much like a conundrum there. It's, it's, it's really hard to do this job pretending that journalists can do this by themselves. So it's almost like you're just sending them uh, just to, to a war without ammunition, right? Exactly. So, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do agree 200% to what you say, that uh, the, the, if there is a level of 99.9% .9 of impunity in Mexico, for instance, because there is never investigation, someone, some governors can kill a journalist, he knows that he will get away with that, nobody will be after him. So that's, we can, of course, you're right, we can talk about collaboration, we can talk about all of that, but that's really, really small compared to first we need some 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 structure political structure <laughs> that has that is really supporting transparency in free information freedom of information and things like that so that's that's a global effort and, and and for sure we that's we are depending on public policy on that um, on uh, not only on in investigating the killing but investigating the corruption and the crimes that journalists are trying to, to investigate, because if there, if there is a level of corruption um, that with a lot of impunity, for sure, the first, the, the, the only guys who will investigate will be the journalists, so they will be very exposed, so that will be a, a good danger. So that's a global issue, for sure, and, and journalists don't, do not have the solution to fix that alone, for sure. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think we have one over there on the on my left. It's really hard to see. It's really hard to see. Yeah, I see nothing. Uh, th thank you all very much. Um, the OCCRP weekly newsletter is me. one that uh, it's always one of the first I open, and I usually make sure people know about it. Um, my question is for all of you, but but based around that, and particularly the, um, the murder of J Jan Kuciak. With your efforts, um, and perhaps you possibly outside your own efforts on that, do you think the case in its widest implications is getting enough attention? Because while I've heard some very encouraging 
points about the publicity. He's had a lot of BBC coverage and, of course, the political impact in Slovakia. I've also heard people in official positions who perhaps shouldn't be paying, who haven't paid enough as, as much attention as they should have done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay, commenting on this case, you are totally right. Actually, the same ruling party is still heading the government, but there is slightly different message that is uh, totally important in Slovakia. And that is actually that people learn that they are much more, much more powerful than they believed because they really changed the government that was there for 10 years. And, you know, there were only, still in, still in January, people were not able to imagine what would need to happen that the former prime minister, Robert Fico, would resign. And it actually happened because of the pressure of the people. And the second really important message that is actually for us journalists is that we have the people behind us. You know, we, we don't see it quite often. We quite often get frustrated, like no one is really interested in the stories anymore. No one is really interested in our cases anymore. But this is very strong message that Yes, the people are still interested. So I would go on a more slightly higher level of what was the impact than actually the change of the government, cosmetic change of the government. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? That gentleman over there, let's change aisle. Hi. Um, in previous lives, I used to work in computer security. Um, the golden rule in computer security is all about workforce differential, how much lead ahead I have in terms of encryption and how much strong needs to be my adversary and so on. Now, the first rule in security is operational security is not better technology. There's no point in having the best technology in the world if your operational security is lousy. So, it seems to me from what I heard in the last two days that there is so much attention of, oh, we need to catch up with technology. They're not going to catch on the technology. They're going to catch in operational security. So to what extent is it clear that encryption gives you a delay until the other party reads your stuff? It doesn't give you the permanent guarantee that nobody will ever read you. Depending who's your adversary, it will be read if they want to. Okay, so the only way is to have good operational security so that the actual encrypted media doesn't lose your hands, you don't lose it, you don't lose a disk, you don't leave your computer unattended and so on. So what can, what can the panel suggest and what is the industry saying about how do we train up the operational security of journals? I think, um, I don't know if he's in, in this room, um, one of my old colleagues, uh, Andrew Lyon, who works for Internews, he did a really good risk assessment on digital security, and a lot of it is looking at be your behavior. Um, when you're crossing borders with a laptop that has all the information, you can have it all encrypted, you can be in interrogation, they'll make you open your computer and use your passwords, etc. So I absolutely, um, I think when we, when I, with FFR and before that we were at Roy Peck, when we were looking at um, safety, it's not looking, it's like physical, it's looking at holistically. So even trauma, for example. Um, and so I think that kind of training and the understanding of risks is, it has to be a combination of all. So I agree with that. I don't, anyone else on the panel can make a uh, comment? I, I think you're right. But the, the only thing to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, there is nothing 100% safe first. Uh, that's, and the one will say that this application is 100% safe is lying. So we, we will discover probably one day that the signal application will be hacked by some NSA guys. So, we, we, so saying that, what can we do? Investigating is, is risky, always. You take some risk. You just have to anticipate, minimize, just to, um, uh, investigate the risk, assessing the risk all the time, and take some de de decision. And the only thing you can do to improve your, your process is to, 
to, to talk with some people who have some kind of experience. But there is nothing 100% safe, so that's the main thing. And um, so there is a way of going to some application versus others. It's, it's much more, I think, to believe in the open source, open source community because there are, we have much more information about the cold source and, and, and everything. So that's just the kind of advice I should, um, I should keep in mind myself to think about what, what kind of, what is the best process. Yeah, and if it's really sensitive, you don't use technology at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned, you meet in the parking Basically. garage. <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, we have someone right at the back. I think I know who she is. Mary, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, there are ways to kill a story without killing a journalist. And I think something that we're increasingly seeing is law being weaponized against journalists, whether it's Burma, Bangladesh, Malta. I mean, the case of Daphne, she was fighting 46 cases at yeah. the time of her murder. Yeah. So I'm just curious, as freelancers, how do you navigate that? And is potentially this idea of collaboration a way also to, to diffuse, diffuse that risk? Um, just, yeah, that's, it. No. that's something I wanted to... Yeah, actually, Laurent wanted to talk about so sort of legal risks as yeah. well, so please do. Now, when you are investigating, uh, you need you need you need to know good lawyers and you need to have a lot of money because um, just to, I can give you one short example I'm I'm sued by the state of Azerbaijan for the past four years because I I, I say about them about the state of Azerbaijan that they were a dictatorship and so they choose the one of the biggest lawyer in France to sue me personally and that's the first time in the history of the French press that the state itself, not the head of state, but the state of Azerbaijan is suing someone. And it cost a lot of money. And we won on each step, on the first level, second level, but um, that we never pay for the lawyers. So that's, that's something, hopefully I'm part of a, um, this documentary I did was part of a, a news organization. So I'm not paying myself the lawyer, but uh, what about the freelancers? Hopefully, I'm not a, uh, a freelancer in that case. But uh, this is um, th that's something quite concerning. But on the trade secrets in the, in Europe right now, there is a, a current trend um, and a lot of lobbying from from many corporations, mostly from the pharmaceutical companies, who who um, who, who are pressurizing sources of journalists and journalists themselves. If you have a document coming from a corporation and you want to publish it, you might be in, pro in, in trouble. And with a collective of journalists in France and in Europe, we did ourselves a lot of lobbying to, to make sure that we can amend a little bit that text. And that's, that's a problem. My company, we were sued by PricewaterhouseCoopers because we were revealing the LuxLeaks story. That cost a lot of money uh, to doing that. So that's, um, that's a problem. Collaboration could be, to answer your question, could be um, an answer to that. If we, um, in France, for instance, a few months ago, one um, judge say that uh, this journalist was not allowed to name the company uh, in an article. Well, 10 other news magazines decided to name the, the company, and that was uh, over the... And, and so I think in that way, um, together we can do something when, we, when some of us is facing legal threats, yeah. May, when you're working as a freelancer, but obviously publishing in news organizations, do they, do they provide you with legal support? Do they ask you to indemnify them? <laughs> what happened? I've, I've seen that happen, actually, in, in contracts where media organizations ask the freelancer to indemnify them should they be sued. Yeah. Have you had that experience? Hopefully not. But. Yes, I, I, for a long time, thought surely this just cannot possibly mean what I think it is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it turns out that many, it's quite standard for contracts to have an indemnity clause. I think there's some pushback on it now. Um, I've been pretty lucky to work with news organizations like The Intercept and um, other magazines that, um, and also I think there's a bit of a UK versus US thing. In America, it's very, very hard for, um, and the onus is on the, the person um, suing to prove that things are, you know, factually incorrect or what have you. And so um, it, there isn't quite 
the same culture of, I think, suing publications and reporters in the way that um, it exists in the UK. However, having said that, um, many articles that I've written, there's usually there's been some, you know, threat of legal action involved because you're writing about things that people don't want <laughs> written about. That's sort of the nature of um, investigative reporting. And uh, yeah, and, and I think it, it does get easier as you collaborate with um, colleagues who have been in similar situations and they might tell you, you know, specific wording you can negotiate or um, ways in which you can move through this particular um, set of issues. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I have an agent now who deals with a lot of that stuff and so then that means I'm not like Googling, you know, <laughs> what what is indemnity clause? Yes. <laughs> How do I get rid of it? And uh, yeah, th and things like, you know, FFR, uh, there's many, many wonderful organizations that you know, their prim primary objective is supporting reporters and um, being plugged into them has been of, you know, it, it's been a real gift in my own life. One, th one project that actually we are working on on FFR is um, with the, the ACOS Alliance is uh, producing a template uh, contract and so that's why I knew about indemnity because it's we've got these amazing lawyers in um, in New York uh, working pro bono, and that's just one of the main things that uh, typical contracts that we've seen that freelancers have been receiving. That's there, and that's that's ridiculous. Um, I have to wrap up. That was it. Thank you so much for coming. Um, hopefully, you learned a little bit about how to work more safely and keep safe there out in the field. And uh, you know, please keep on reporting and, and doing your amazing stories. Um, I think it's very important. So thank you. Thank you.